Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, appreciate everyone showing up for this, this session. We're going to talk today about how, uh, at least from the AT&T perspective, how workloads, uh, where they came from, and what, what, what are we seeing today in terms of change, and what are we seeing in the future in terms of what we're planning for. Uh, to, I'm, uh, my name is Toby Ford. Uh, I'm an architect within the, the AT&T's transformation effort called Domain2, working on the NFV and SDN. I'm also a board member of OpenStack and of OPNFV and an of advisory group of uh, Open Daylight. Hey, everyone. Morning. Welcome. My name is Amit Tank. Uh, I lead the architecture efforts for cloud and SDN uh, for AT&T Entertainment Group also focusing on open source and containerization. Thanks again for joining. Let's uh, get started. All right. So where we came from, I'll give you a little story to start. Um, it was about 1996 when um, I got a job as a consultant to, uh, as a Unix system administrator to go and work on a a system in uh, uh, hosting uh, an I, a little ISP in Eindhoven in, in, in the Netherlands, uh, and they asked me to fix this, this uh, server that was having problems. So I logged in, and I started to get to work, and I, uh, I was looking at what they were doing and what, what the kind of problem they were having. On this box, a single x86 server running FreeBSD, they were running 2,000 web servers, distinct NCSA, HTTP, D processes running, each one representing another customer. So 2,000 customers on an x86 box of 1996. I thought, wow, that's really pressing it. Uh, what happens if one, one customer gets loud and or gets popular, and then you know, what, what's the impact on the others? And that was, in essence, what the problem was. But it, it gives us a, kind of the beginning of the, at least my view of the story and of many of the workloads that were, uh, were moving to the cloud. So that you just take the most simplest form of that, there's a web server. It's serving up uh, static HTML and a few GIFs and such, and then it advertises a, a customer, uh, advertises a, a company's, uh, you know, it's their first presence on the web. Over time, one server wasn't enough. I needed to split the load, load balances appeared, uh, or I needed more dynamic content, have databases. You know, from, from the kind of internet era and the, the sort of cloud era, that's, that was kind of the standard, you know, a LAMP stack. Uh, and as it's progressed, more and more things happen around it. So the workload has expanded to include other aspects. So like, um, a fully loaded e-commerce website of 1992 had many, many web servers and uh, an application layer and databases. And then uh, for it to be at all scalable across uh, a lot of users, you ended up having to use some type of uh, caching system, an Akamai of some kind. You had caching nodes out there. And I think of the caching nodes as an integral part of that whole story. So this, this footprint, when you actually look at what was happening, in many cases, you just, the workload itself was processes, their configuration, and some kind of state. Some kind of state that sometimes was persisted to disks, uh, sometimes it was a transitory in memory. But when you look at the root level of what an Oracle database or a MySQL database is, or uh, some kind of J2EE platform and or a web server, these were just processes with config and state. Now, as we've gone from then, you know, these things were running on monolithic uh, uh, servers, just single boxes running these processes. Uh, over time, we've realized that, you know, the way that this uh, hosting company was able to do 2,000 servers is because most people are delusional about how much, how popular their website is or how much workload it takes. So in the end, we started to take and move things onto virtual machines and start to bin pack workloads and such. And then, this has evolved lately to things like containers and LexD. And then the question is, in the future, is that going to look like unikernels as we get more into single process containers and microservices? Is it going to be unikernels? Or are we going to take a kind of a mis another direction, a tangent into serverless land? But 
really this move to containers, it really hasn't changed the workload itself, even though there's a lot of talk about it being microservices and such. It may change the topology a bit, but in the end, it's always processes, config, and some kind of uh, state. Very interesting. And I, I, I like how you laid it out in a very simple manner that really, what do we uh, define as our workload? It's, it's a combination of processes, configuration, and those database. So moving on, I think if we extend that idea, a lot of uh, uh, models of consumptions of your applications have evolved and come full circle. They started with that kind of a, a mode where a lot of your services were meant to run in its own environment, in kind of like a, a singleton environment. As we went along, this is how our workload architecture looks today. And uh, uh, I'm taking, we're taking an example of something that is very, very uh, uh, pervasive, whether it's a media workload, we call it like media virtual functionalization, or it's virtual network uh, uh, function uh, VNFs uh, that are being uh, deployed on a cloud native uh, platform. You're looking at an OpenStack control plane which has all of these services laid out running as microservice. So I think one interesting thing that has uh, evolved as people who have attended some past two summits is there is a trend to uh, treat your cloud infrastructure itself as a CI CD capable infrastructure. In order to do that, you are better off deploying each of these services on its own, uh, some kind of a container or a VM, but on its own running in conjunction with the rest of the services. Now, once you have your OpenStack control plane up and running, typically the way our data plane are structured, they are essentially massive stream computing farms. Uh, anytime uh, uh, the processes that we uh, learned earlier, anytime this, these kind of uh, uh, processing has to be done on, say, for a firewall as a service product or a, a IPS, IDS as a service, VNF, there is a 10 gigabit plus traffic incoming. Your, uh, v, uh, your uh, function are actually spread, it could be spread across servers which are being chained, and then those thread database could be fetched from the cloud. Once those uh, uh, thread signatures are fetched, essentially what really these servers are doing is simply peeking into every single packet and detecting whether something has uh, triggered those alarms or not, and then it uh, moves all the traffic to egress. So really this is like a, a, a workload that, a significant, that characterizes video workload or it could characterize any kind of VNF. Yeah, just let me to add to the slide a bit, is mm -hmm. the, the concept too is, um, the workloads, uh, when you look at, when you drive down into them, even if you look at an IPS and IDS system, or if you look at a web server, web server is, uh, uh, has a, is a listening, listening for HTTP, uh, gets posts and, and such, and then responding with, with some content or some, some response code. Uh, this sort of listening and then responding with information or listening, going out and getting information, and then responding. This pattern is very similar, whether it's a web server, a database server, I'm taking in requests for SQL and then giving out data, or if I'm doing threat response where I'm going and uh, I see a packet, I go and make a search against a, a signature database, mm -hmm. and then I respond and change the packet or deny the packet or reroute the packet, or add some type of information about where to, head, or where to point it, this is this general pattern you overlay on the processes. It will become important in our story later. Yes. So that's one dimension of it is the topology of the uh, workloads and how they've, they're changing and what they're doing. But then another aspect of it is how we lay them out. Uh, as it starts, if you just had a single web server, um, you know, and this is very similar to other things that we've done, like SIP gateways or uh, voice, voice platforms or elements of our uh, mobility platform. These, these elements, if we just put them into a single building, you know, as a telco, we're very proud of our central offices, and we try to push as hard as possible to make those central offices have five nines of availability, but it's very difficult to get them to six nines of availability. 
uh, it's almost impossible without a lot of extra cost, adding 16-foot concrete walls and, and a lot of extra overhead for heating and cooling and powering this, this facility. Now, and then adding in not two links, three, four links to make it possible to, to get beyond that. Very expensive and not likely. So you have this building that at most can be five nines with a web server or some other function in it that, you know, best case, sure, there's times when in the building I can spread it out and, and um, have multiple web servers, and that can get close to four or five nines of availability. But the reality is if I have a service that needs six, I need to have two sites. So the workload has to be in two sites to get to six nines of availability. And so that's a typical uh, SLA that we have in our environment. So if you have six nines of availability even on top of five nines buildings, I could have actually had ten nines of, of availability with, that, with uh, two setups of, of five nines. And the beauty is if I only need six, I can actually reduce the, the reliability of the facilities down to three nines. And this presents a possibility that we have taken advantage of and then others have taken advantage of where you can make perfect services or things that appear perfect at six plus nines, but on less reliable facilities or less reliable underlying resource. So this is important in the workload because you have to consider the geographic distribution of the workload uh, to create, uh, to meet the expectations. Now, that's just with regard to reliability. As we get into durability and keeping data uh, secure and not losing data, if you want to have, you know, for the longest time we've used tapes to put our data onto a, a, a tape, and then uh, we put it into a truck from Iron Mountain, and Iron Mountain takes it off into a building that has 16-foot wall. Uh, so great. But still, this tape does not have a, an enormous amount of, it has, has pretty good durability, get to nine, ten nines of durability, but it's still an enormous risk to flooding or uh, some kind of issue with the, the truck running into something, blah, blah, blah. Um, so one of the innovations that Amazon did uh, long ago was realize that if you want to have really durable data, that you have to have it in multiple sites. And really, if you want to have it in uh, to get beyond tapes, you have to actually put it into three centers. And so this starts to bring into another dimension of the workloads, is understanding the latency between aspects of that, that workload. And that becomes important on uh, one of the, the really integral theorems around the cloud is this CAP theorem is saying, you know, how far apart can the, the data be to make it so that uh, it stays consistent and, and uh, when you make changes to it. Uh, this, this concept is important because uh, you have to have the actual uh, redundancy close in terms of latency to keep it consistent, but not too close so that one nuclear attack or one flood or uh, all in the same power plane cause, power grid cause it to fail. So this is an important part of the topology of the application as it's evolved over time as the nines have, have increased. Alongside of that though, what, when it comes to latency and speed of light limitations, we also have realized that the workload has to be closer to the user. As I was saying, uh, a typical workload of the early 2000s had to have Akamai to make right. it truly available and uh, have the user experience be, be positive. And so you started to see caching nodes extend closer and closer to the user. One of the dynamics that we'd like to point out is that at some point, the possibility exists where the caching of a workload uh, and this ex uh, sort of geographic distribution has to start to look like as close as to you as possible. So right. ideally, if I'm watching Man of Steel or some other movie, it's actually here instead of mm -hmm. uh, in Los Angeles. And so this, is, this part is a, a dynamic where we're, we're seeing the caching starting to show up closer and closer to the user, even perhaps on the device itself on your DVR or on a residential kind of head end of our uh, video centers. So the workload is, is really, in the way I look at it, is expanding to be out toward the access or the edge part of our, our networks. Exactly. I think the, the point about proximity is head, uh, was right on. 
Yeah, and then part of the story is for us is, okay, when you look at the edge and how it, what it, what's happening there, there's a lot of functions for, for an operator like ourselves. So there's, there are the routers and the, the access, the VOLT, the, the taking the, the fiber out to the home. All that's one part of our infrastructure. But then as we've like required DirecTV, uh, we have other things, satellite, uh, uh, we have residential gateways, we have uh, DVRs, and then as IoT happens, these things are everywhere. And one of the, the issues we have in OpenStack today is the view that OpenStack can only really manage the virtual machines and processes, uh, the configs, the state that are near it. Nova was designed to assume that the, the servers that it administers are all real nearby. Uh, but does it make sense to put OpenStack in every RG or every uh, DVR? Probably not. not yeah. And so we have a, a, an option. We feel like it's essential to start to think of having maybe Nova talk to things that have more latency between it and, and what it manages so that we, we're able to actually take advantage of maybe unused parts of a DVR or a, an aspect of the as access network. Very, very appropriate, and I, I, I kind of uh, see a lot of uh, potential for something like OpenStack to be used in what we call as our RG evolution. And uh, I think I would totally agree with uh, uh, Toby's uh, uh, assessment that uh, you, you have that ability to leverage certain edge locations and leverage OpenStack, which can do a very good job at serving those edge use cases where you have devices where that absolutely depend on proximity. So in this, uh, this diagram, we're showing something that we're working on together right now is uh, this concept where the actual, what runs on the RG is actually a stack of, of a container stack. Mm -hmm. And then that, how we actually make it work, and, and one of my beliefs is that the workload is very much impacted by the developer process it takes to evolve that workload. And as we've seen, you know, if you take, start from the web server example before, I worked on my uh, HTML, I FTP'd it up to the site, and it showed up. Uh, over time, that evolved to things like Capistrano and um, other mechanisms like that, or in the most, uh, what I thought was a beautiful example of, of integration into a developer's workflow is like Heroku where you know, instead of using version control as part of my process, mm -hmm. uh, I actually just inserted Heroku and used it as not only the version control, but also the way I deploy new content. And so that workflow becomes part of the, the, the developer workflow becomes part of the, the application topology. And then in this example we have with the RG is, is uh, we're wanting to enable the developer to work on the RG and all of its functions on, right. its, on your laptop, and then be able to take it and test it and emulate it in the cloud and verify that it works and get all the regression testing and add all the cool agile test-driven parts of it to it, and then eventually push it out to maybe embedded hardware. So this, this flow is another part of the workloads and how they're changing over time and making, it's a cool convergence of the agile methods with, with what the cloud is able to do, and then hopefully what, what we're suggesting is making the cloud be able to extend to, to devices out at the edge. Very cool, and I, I totally agree that uh, this has potential to actually create a lot of value for our developers as well as for our customers, because you can decouple, you can move your software innovation cycle at a much faster rate without having to depend on the hardware cycle. So moving on, this is a very interesting uh, uh, layout uh, of some of our workloads and how they're transforming. Toby, you want to take this one? No, you got it. OK. So uh, I think uh, some of these uh, uh, workloads that we uh, basically learned about today, many of these workloads, when they originated, they were very, very monolithic apps. Video apps, very monolithic app. You, you, let's say you have an authentication app of you, or you have a mobility infra app, or some kind of video encoder, typically all these VMs, as they evolved over a period of time, they had lots and lots of dependencies packed 
tightly into one monolithic blob, which would then, having, uh, having had so many dependencies, would create bottlenecks for a person to then upgrade, downgrade, troubleshoot once it's in live environment. And I think as, as AT&T, there is a big emphasis put on empowering our engineering, our engineers, our uh, QA people, our architects, our designers to actually unshackle ourselves from that mindset that a software has to only look like this or an appliance, uh, a particular function can only be done by appliances. So what we did was we leveraged OpenStack, we moved to common off the shelf hardware which essentially could be very well uh, be any kind of open compute device. And we started treating everything as a, uh, as a very generic set of compute capacity, VMs coming from AIC or any other cloud. And on top of that, we essentially build a tenant level CI CD framework that leverages Docker containers to deliver your applications. Docker containers themselves needs to be orchestrated. So whether it's a video application or it could be a VNF, those orchestrators like Kubernetes play a vital role there. Someday when uh, OpenStack control plane itself is containerized. You could find yourself, uh, uh, you could find yourself in a situation where Kubernetes is actually also orchestrating your OpenStack infrastructure. But otherwise, overall, we see a lot of value in going this uh, model because it is quite extensible and it has uh, a lot of potential to uh, build upon. So I'm going to go uh, give you another story from, uh, I'll tell you about the uh, early 90s. There was an episode where there was a big hacking attack up against the network. And then uh, there was this fellow at AT&T. His name was uh, Bill Cheswick. And then one of the ways that he was using to uh, deal with this attack was to create this honeypot. And then he did this using a, a function in Unix at the time, Chiroot. And then in that process, this is how he came up with or helped to, uh, participate in the creation of some of the first firewalls. But essentially, that first firewall was a Chiruted jail and a PF, a, pro, a packet filter. And then this evolved over time uh, to be a, much other th a lot of other things. But essentially, at the very beginning, it was a, essentially a container. So what I think is cool is it's kind of come full circle. As you know, there was a period of time where you know, take uh, Unix box, you put uh, IP tables or uh, the kind of free BSD version of uh, PF and onto the system, work up what it takes to essentially make a firewall, and then you strap a label on it and then have some fancy GUI or website uh, that, that configures it. Uh, and you, you, make a, you put the, the label on it and say, this is in a firewall. So it becomes a, a thing, an appliance. And now in the mid 2000s, we took that appliance and made it virtual. Oh, great, we put it into a VM. Uh, and now we're taking it to the next step and then you know, making firewalls as a service. So you can easily spin up more of these uh, firewall or VMs or mm -hmm. really configuring just IP tables uh, to, to manage packets over here. Uh, or even uh, in our case, taking that firewall and making it a part of the SDN. So this flow, if you look at it, what we're coming back to is essentially the, 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 the topology of a firewall of that particular VNF mm -hmm. is just a process with config, with state, that is taking in information, you know, looking at uh, databases for what to do with this, maybe dropping packets and then stopping it or sending it on. This pattern, the same pattern, doesn't matter if it's firewalls or you, you can look at load balancers or uh, uh, session border gateways within a, a voice system within our environment or P gateways or any of the things that we're working on, they share the same pattern. Uh, interesting part of this dynamic, as I was saying, is, uh, and this is actually well described in the Andromeda paper from Google, is look, we started to wake up to this idea that, hey, I had all these firewalls and load balancers and IPS devices and then um, you know, session border gateways, whatever. If you look at what they do, they open up a packet, they do stuff, and they close the packet and send it on. And they open up a packet, do stuff, close the packet, send it on. Open up a packet, do stuff, send it on. 
that's a lot of overhead and opening and closing packets, and that limits the amount of uh, throughput that you can get. Right. What we've seen is a consolidation down to, hey, maybe we can do that all in one place. And even better, can we do it in a way that's very, uh, um, you know, programmatic? And that's where the concept of service function chaining comes from. And then being able to do all of those functions inside of the, inside of the SDN itself. And then this proposes a, a kind of a, a how to, a, you know, question for, as an architect, what is the balance between, do we put it in the SDN? Do we put aspects of like the session border gateway in the SDN? Or do we, we split it out and make it a separate thing that gets run as if it's a, as is of a web server. Right. Very, yeah, very, very interesting uh, perspective on like uh, what kind of design paradigm you take. And some of these design paradigms may work uh, for certain use cases while you may find other companies taking a different route because their use cases demand a more, uh, more finer control. So uh, in, in summary, I think what uh, appears very clearly is that OpenStack, it obviously has so much of uh, capability built over a period of time, like something like Nova, for example. I spent this week, this last four days, attending different sessions and realized that Nova does try to do a lot for a lot of use cases, and at times, for use cases which require extremely high performance, things like we just saw earlier, a media function virtualization or a virtual uh, VNF, virtual network function, you may want NOVA to be leaner, not necessarily beefier. You may want NOVA to actually work with some kind of a, plug, a pluggable SDN controller. And it, it dawned upon me that uh, I had educated myself about Gluon in Austin, but I think that this, this summit was really the time when uh, it, it kind of like became apparent that something like a Gluon, which allows a NOVA to extend itself to different distributions, what kind of workload that it's supposed to uh, drive on a target cloud, it, it becomes absolutely vital. Gluon becomes absolutely vital because essentially now you could make it work with Open Contrail, or you could make it work with, work with Plum Grid, or you could make it work, make it work with Midokura, and your use case may differ even within the same cloud. If your use case was video related, you absolutely, your time to first packet matters a lot. Whereas if your use case was serving web service, it's not probably gonna be that vital. So I think that uh, I would say that my take, take away from this summit, one of the takeaways from this summit was uh, the, the importance of some kind of framework that allows Neutron to extend itself with different kinds of SDN uh, providers. Yeah, and in addition to that, as a, this is a, so obviously I've been working very much on the Gluon project and appreciate them at, uh, selling it for me that way. The, uh, the other part of it is about Nova is that I think it's time to think about how do I either use Nova or do something else that actually extends to be able to take on the edge and the access use cases. Um, and, and then as well, not only be able to expand out to the edge and the access part of our, our problem, but also mm -hmm. deal more with our problem of what, what services should be centralized and what should be distributed. Right. And find a way to make a more of a, how do I manage many, many locations? Today at at and we have, you know, we're pushing 100 significant OpenStack deployments. And then now we're talking about in the next round, uh, especially with 5G, expanding to a, a far more uh, number this way. And it, knowing the dynamics of 5G and densification, you have to be in a lot more places. Right. Very interesting. So. I think that's the, the main story, but I wanted to add a postscript to our uh, thing that's uh, just as we were here. So, you know, one of the dynamics that, so we kind of made the argument along the way that the workloads are changing uh, and the way that we're managing them is changing, but justifying kind of how do I apply the cloud to every area that we work on? More because the, everything looks the same and then uh, it, I can use the same patterns to manage things everywhere. Now, one of the benefits of doing this, um, you know, not coming at it from, from what I'm about to talk about, um, it makes it so that as we talked about, the customers get better, more functions faster, we can move uh, like functions into RG quickly. Mm -hmm. That's a cool part of it, but 
The other part of it that's essential, so that's the benefit to the customers that get real-time capabilities, real-time access to resources and real-time access to change. But for us as a provider, the cool part is that we're able to do, we're able to really look at our assets and use them. So this is more than just, hey, I have a server, I virtualize it, and then now I can have, I can run many tenants on it, and I can oversubscribe it, and you know, like many of the enterprise uh, VMware setups, they're like, wow, it's 400% oversubscription. <laughs> uh, you know, and I tell them about the time I saw this, this box that had pretty much 2,000% uh, oversubscription. But anyway, so the, but the concept of utilization is very important in our world, and we've, we've taken advantage of it in the past with things like the two lines that to connect your house to the, to the phone network and the, the phone network itself. We created this thing called statistical multiplexing, which allowed us to oversubscribe copper and be able to use more, uh, uh, more of that asset for more tenants. We're doing the same thing with Spectrum. We're doing a lot of creative things to take a frequency and be able to st stack lots of uh, traffic on it. We're taking fiber and getting a tremendous amount of, of, of usage out of it. And then we're looking at our facilities as, the, as Moore's Law continues to press on us. It's continuing to cause a, like the, a common commercial uh, uh, data center that used to fill the room be all contained in a, in a one-use server. Mm -hmm. When you look at a central office today, that's what's happened, is uh, this big of a space is basically now available to fit into your mobile device. Exactly. So that Moore's Law is, is, is a part of this dynamic, not only in terms of, of, of causing it more dense uh, possibilities, but it's also making it so there's less utilization. And so this part of it is, really important, and as I was saying in my earlier example, like if you look at the web servers of 1996 that they were having 2,000 web servers on, if you go ahead 20 years, Moore's Law basically is two, four, blah, 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 up to 2,000 times more capacity is available in that server. So if you think that one server can only run a one web server, uh, something's wrong. Right. Uh, because it can do a lot more than that. And that delusion or that change in dynamic is causing a lot of underutilization. And for us, we, we have to address that. Mm -hmm. Very important point. So at this juncture in the presentation, I think it, it uh, reminds me a very interesting uh, 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 perspective. Now, before I go into that, let me give you guys some little bit of uh, uh, opportunity to uh, stretch it up a little bit. By a show of hands, how many of you took a train a railroad train to get to this venue. Oh, okay. At least there are several people here. Now, if I had asked this question back in Boston, there would be literally zero people who would have taken this. So a very wise professor, I learned, I learned something from a very wise professor a long time ago. Uh, back in its heyday, in the, in the earlier 20th, 20th century, the railroad in US, in America, was like a very big thing. It was like the, uh, uh, the, the most major entity, most major enterprise that was available. And it had such a bullish and bright future. However, it went extinct. And why exactly did it go extinct? And there was a very interesting study done. Turns out, the railroad industry was always in a belief that they were they, they thought that they were in the business of running trains, running railroad carts. What they didn't realize were that was, was that that was not really the case. They were actually in the business of uh, mobilizing people. And had they realized that, probably they could have been better positioned to make the transition to airline industry or the airline aviation. So it kind of like brings me back that electricity, for example, the electric grid, it evolved over a period of time. And now you see a very, very dynamic uh, function in your electric grid that if you have an excess capacity in certain part of your geography, you could have that excess capacity uh, used up somewhere else based on the usage pattern. So it, you, can, you can draw some very interesting parallels between electric grid and computing grid. And I'll let Toby drive that. Yeah, and this, this comes from a, really a book uh, from about 10 years ago that talked about how, you know, a hundred years ago, the electrical companies formed. At first, the, when electricity started, 
the factories were uh, building their own generation on site. Where I lived as a kid, the, uh, there was still a remnant of this where there was a hydroelectric dam attached to the uh, Alcoa uh, reduction plant, the aluminum reduction plant. Uh, now over time, uh, more centralized uh, power showed up and the way that it was able to disintermediate localized power was because they were able to take assets like generators and use them all the time. So the story in Big Switch is basically during the day the manufacturers uh, were uh, using the power grid and then at night they applied it to, uh, in Chicago, they applied it to the lighting. And so this allowed them to take non-coincident peaks of workloads, mm -hmm. put them together and get higher asset utilization. And the, the big switch story is essentially this is what Google and Amazon have been doing, um, and this was 10 years ago, talking about how they take many workloads, take the non-coincident uh, utilization of, of disparate workloads and pack them together and get higher over subscription, even more than just sharing a resource, uh, but, but bin packing utilization. So this, this concept today, I mean, you see this, uh, and this is one of the reasons why Amazon's so successful, and something I believe that OpenStack probably should enable at some point, is the ability to auction off unused resource. So the spot instances are genius because it takes workloads maybe in the middle of the, or uh, resources in the middle of the night that don't do anything, and then allows HPC or batching jobs or whatever big data jobs to happen then, so this allows the, the infrastructure to be fully utilized at all times. Uh, nowadays, a rack gets rolled into an Amazon data center and it's fully utilized instantaneously. For an enterprise, it could take maybe a year before it gets ramped up to full utilization, if, it, if ever, given Moore's law. So this dynamic is, uh, and then Google lately just uh, announced preemptive instances. So this is, this is an important concept that they're recognizing that drives down the cost of the infrastructure for customers and it allows us to get to the same kind of centralized uh, utility dynamics that, uh, that were shown up in the electric grid. Very interesting, very interesting. So that, uh, if we go back before I go to this slide, I mean, this is a part of the workloads that have to be managed better and in one of the areas that I think we could use some more evolution on mm -hmm. with regard to not just placement scheduling but life cycle scheduling inside of OpenStack is, is thinking about, okay, um, I've watched this workload over time, I see how it works, maybe how do I consolidate it and put it together? I still don't think we've really meaningfully addressed the, the, the competition of a, of a DRS, uh, dynamic resource scheduling in VMware, make it something that right. could do something similar. Right. My last slide, just to, to close out, is, uh, my father we used to work at this facility in Niagara Falls. He was in charge of this dam. And this dam is uh, an extension of the story of, the, uh, of, of using uh, non-coincident peak utilization. So this dam was designed to take advantage of an arbitrage between the, the cost of power in uh, the middle of the night versus the day. So the middle of the night, it's the cost of power is less given that uh, uh, people don't use it and then the power companies figure out long ago they want to make it less so people use things at night as, as much as possible. So they actually take advantage of it themselves by uh, using uh, a reservoir where they pump the water uphill in the middle of the night and then store the energy uh, at night inside of this uh, lake, this reservoir, and then during the day they actually generate power as well as bring water from Niagara Falls. Um, so this, this concept is not only do they have the manufacturing peak utilization and the people's usage of watching TV, but they also are able to take advantage of it at night and then be able to increase uh, revenue during the day. Very cool. Very Another cool story, just to leave this, is uh, there's a, this is kind of like Homer Simpson, in the control center of this uh, building, they had this panel with a big red button. And if you press that button, uh, you could turn off Niagara Falls. <laughs> um, so you, uh, they did that in order to, if they saw people coming down the up, upstream of the river, if they saw them coming in barrels, they could press the button. And then they ended up building a concrete uh, walkway on one side of the falls so that the policemen could walk out and, and save the person from themselves. Very interesting. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, uh, you joining us for the session. Hopefully, you found some of the content that we discussed today 
meaningful and something that you could uh, derive insights from. So, if you have any questions, uh, you can stand up to the microphone, I believe. Yeah, um, thank you for the very inter interesting uh, presentation. And you mentioned about uh, transforming the monolithic application workload uh, to the cloud native, like container native application. Um, it seems that, you know, in terms of uh, telco application, there have been a, a long history of developing monolithic stiff applications. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be quite difficult to move uh, to a container base or a cloud native application. So what do you think is the biggest challenge for the application developers to move that, make that happen? Uh, and another question I have is that transition would take some time, I believe, mm -hmm. and there would be a, a situation where there is a cloud native application and monolithic legacy application on bare metal, on VM, so there will be like hybrid environment. So would there be a new challenge on, in the, those circumstances in terms of uh, management in cloud SDNs? Sure. The first two things, before we get into the technical part of it, I mm -hmm. think the first two things are ossified neural networks and then uh, initiative. It's just really changing your way of thinking of it mm -hmm. uh, and then taking the initiative to actually make an open source, uh, whatever, P-Gateway or a, a, a MMMC or a HSS, just going out and making an open source version of that. Right. You know, we've seen a lot of initiative taken for operating systems and compilers and web servers and browsers, uh, but not a lot in that area. So that's, those are two, two kind of people dynamics that are in right. the way of progress in this regard. Right. I, I'm glad, so, so glad you mentioned about the opening the mindset. So the question that was asked here was a two-part question. The first part was, you have these legacy applications, what kind of challenges uh, do we normally encounter uh, in turning those into cloud native? I think the biggest, single biggest challenge that uh, people uh, encounter, organizations encounter, is in attempting to decompose an existing legacy applications, many of those assumptions that were horrible assumptions, technical debt that were baked into your legacy applications, now they, they basically, they arise. They, they arise from the dead and like, uh, you uh, people are not ready to uh, necessarily adopt their, a different way of doing certain things. If, if certain applications are expecting a persistent database, uh, I think to move, to move those subcomponents from using a persistent database to a purely NoSQL uh, key value pair that is uh, accessible through REST API and the persistence is achieved somewhere far away, those kind of decomposition challenges are, I think, are the major challenges. In terms of time, I would say it's definitely not an, not an overnight uh, job or not even like a one month or, or one quarter job. I think your success of your OpenStack endeavor is going to depend upon how smoothly can you take some of your greenfield application and build, and build them around OpenStack and then gradually turn your brownfield application one by one into decomposable microservices. Yeah, and one, one additional point is, is uh, at a technical level is, you know, the VNFs, many of them were built into hardware. So if you take just a firewall or a switch uh, router, many times the functions were offloaded uh, in the past to hardware, to ASICs, to FPGAs, or GPUs, you know, the, 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 or really purpose-built hardware. And so part of the, the tricky thing that we're dealing with is finding the right balance of what happens in software and what may happen in the hardware. And so now we have options available to us, and then it's getting better all the time, where we're able to have more uh, easy to program hardware acceleration uh, with FPGA and GPUs. So this part of it too is, is related to the paradigm shift is, is realizing, okay, I can take something that's custom built and then find general purpose ways of solving it, mm -hmm. and then finding that right balance of what happens in hardware and software. It, it will very likely not all entirely be solved with software. We just have to find that right balance. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, next, next question. Uh, hi. Uh, what do you see as the challenges coming from 5G and 5G with respect to the cloud? 
Yeah, well, I mean, number one is that uh, with 5G and any amount of increase in bandwidth, uh, the reality is that you can't use the cell towers we have now to deliver that. Um, you can, but only close to that antenna. The, th the, re the thing is, as you increase bandwidth, you have to increase power, and then it limits the, the, uh, how far it is that uh, you can transmit data. And so this, is, this causes what is known as densification, uh, where we actually have to have a far more distributed set of antennas. Um, that's why you see other players showing up. There's an enormous amount of opportunity for disintermediation in the space because of this concept. So now Wi-Fi providers or cable companies can get into this space because they know we may end up having to have an antenna inside of your house or really near your house or uh, inside of your buildings and such. So this is, I think, probably the biggest challenge. Not the rest of it we have down solid of how to actually make it work, uh, but the real problem is this issue that uh, we were getting at before is, is how do I, I push out antennas far more uh, in a more dense way. Thank you. Sure, you're welcome. All right, thank All right, you very thank much. Thank you very much.